Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to get started. Oh, <laughs> All right, hello, hello everyone. I'm Carrie Trotta Bremen. I'm the director of the Gender Institute, and welcome. I just wanted to make uh, a few brief announcements of upcoming talks. I'm going to circulate some lectures that Kari Winter is organizing, and we are an official depository for donations for Haven House. Uh, which is for abused women and children, and they have a shopping list of items that they need. And on that list are the items uh, that they are most urgently need right now. So please take a copy, we can make more. And our donation bag is in the back. Also, I'm going to circulate this, where I'm really delighted to bring Nancy Maribal here to campus. She is a professor or historian, actually, of Afro-Cubana history in the late 19th century. Uh, Dalia and Camillo are, are Camillo are bringing her here on March 12th. I believe that's the date. I'm working mm -hmm. from memory here. Yes. <laughs> and there is lunch provided. It'll be a very nice event with lecture, but you need to register in advance for the lunch. By March 4th. By March 4th. So that's really coming up. And that will be in Capen in the uh, seminar room over there, the Martin. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And saved the biggest event for last. In nine days, we will be having our centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment, uh, which gave women the right to vote. Although that verb gave women the right has been um, very contested by historians. And I'm really delighted. We have some three major figures coming here, including Holly Jackson, who wrote American Radicals, How the 19th Century Protest, Shape the Nation. I've been reading it. It's absolutely terrific. She has a great op-ed piece in the Washington Post on our website. We have the link. And Lisa Tetrault, many of you know her work. She's a historian at Carnegie Mellon and has written The History on Seneca Falls and Rethinking the Myth. And Anastasia Kerwood from Kentucky. She's another historian and she's writing a biography of Shirley Chisholm, who is buried here in Forest Lawn. So she's also coming to pay tribute to Chisholm, and we're going to go to Forest Lawn and lay flowers mm -hmm. at her grave. So it's going to be um, a very significant event, very much looking forward to it. But today, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Professor Eric Seaman is currently chair of the History Department, where he teaches courses on early American history and the Atlantic world. Before becoming chair, Eric served as the director of the Humanities Institute for six years, from 2011 to 2016, actually for five years. And, <laughs> it's a recover. And I had the pleasure of being Eric's co-conspirator for three of those years at the HI, where I saw firsthand his incredible ability to lead with integrity, fairness, and with a much appreciated air of calm. He is a renowned scholar on religion, death, and cross-cultural encounters in the New World. He's the author of four books, as well as a co-edited collection with Jorge Canizadas Escada, entitled The Atlantic and Global History from 1500 to 2000, which is currently in its second edition. Most recently, Eric published Speaking with the Dead in Early America, which appeared in this fall 2019 with UPenn Press. It tells the prehistory of Victorian spiritualism. Many of you will remember Lily Dale earlier this academic year to look at how the early colonial era to the antebellum period saw people and largely women quietly speaking to their dead, dead children, spouses, and parents, despite its forbidden nature in Protestant America. It's a fantastic book, beautifully written, and a model of how to write to a general readership as well. It also has a perfect opening anecdote about Eric's grandfather, and I don't want to spoil it, but definitely take a look, and there's copies there for sale. And I have wonderful news to share, though the official word has to wait till April. Speaking with the Dead in Early America has been awarded the very prestigious Lawrence Levine Prize in Cultural History by the Organization of American Historians. So congratulations, Eric. Beautiful. It was great working with you those years at the Humanities yeah, Institute. And, uh, nice to come over to your new institute. And, uh, you're just moving around various institutes. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, sort of formidable collection of expertise and knowledge here. 
making me think I should have presented this before publication and gotten your advice, but um, I'll be obviously interested to hear what you have to say. I'm uh, doing a number of book talks over the next uh, six months or year that I have scheduled, um, so uh, your ideas will help me uh, better present this uh, in the future. Um, so, so thank you. So the books are on sale over here, 20 bucks cash. Um, uh, that's, what I, that's what I paid for them for my, for my uh, publisher. So pick them up if you want. Um, there's postcards and, and other handouts about it as well. Um, so let me just tell you about where the book came from, where my idea for the book came from. And it came out of my teaching. Um, every other year or so I teach a big lecture class called Death in America to 100 or 150 students. Um, and one of my students' favorite topics is spiritualism, as Carrie alluded to. Um, they always find it fascinating and surprising and a little bit strange. This is a reaction to a lot of the stuff in my class, um, but uh, they're very curious about it. Um, and I, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a colonial North Americanist and Atlanticist by training, so my specialty is, is earlier, and so spiritualism has, has long been a teaching and the thing that I always noticed and surprised me about it uh, was how, how quickly it, it exploded across the landscape, right? It starts in 1848 with the Fox Sisters east of Rochester in Hydesville, New York. Um, 1950, they show off their talents in New York City, their ability to, to speak with the dead. And by the end of that decade, spiritualists are claiming that there are millions of spiritualists in the United States. So this is a religious movement that goes from zero adherents to, to millions, it's probably more like hundreds of thousands, um, uh, over the course of a decade. Where does that come from? So I'm just gonna, so oh, this is my uh, book. Um, just make sure that we're all on the same page with spiritualism because some of us went to Lilydale this fall, um, but some of you may not. Uh, know about it that much. But this the movement that my students are interested in was started by the, these Fox sisters, the two on the left in particular. They were only 10 and 14 years old when they started hearing knocking in their house. And they said that they it was a, the spirit of a ghost knocking in their house. They could communicate with this person. They eventually created an elaborate system of, of knocks corresponding to, to alphabetic the alphabet so that they would ask the ghost questions and it would, uh, and it would respond. Um, this, so as I said, they, they, they went on tour in 1850 and after they showed off their talents, other people claimed to be also, uh, also have this power, to be mediums, to be able to communicate with the dead. And then this ritual emerged, the ritual of the seance. This did not uh, exist before the Fox sisters. This is an illustration from Germany in 1853, which gives you a sense of how quickly this, this spread across the Atlantic as well. My, my focus is really on North America. You'll notice the women and men alternating. Uh, their their uh, opposing energies were supposed to work best uh, uh, alternated like this. Um, but the, the mediums were, the large majority of mediums were female. There was a boom in spirit photography in the decades after this. This is Mary Todd Lincoln being visited by good old Abe there in spirit. People would go to uh, studios where, where spirit photographers had the ability to capture the spirits around them uh, in images. There were, there were thousands and thousands of these. Eastman uh, 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 in Rochester has a fantastic collection of these. <coughs> and spiritualism is a movement that continues to this day. Um, Lilydale in Chautauqua County is a community of mediums that was founded in, uh, in, the late in the late 19th century. It looks like Chautauqua, if you've ever been to the, the actual Chautauqua. Um, this looks like a kind of miniature version of that, Lilydale Assembly, world's largest center for the religion of spiritualism. And we went and had lots of fun uh, in September. Um, and uh, mediums were there and gave us readings. Um, and my wife evidently had a very active mm -hmm. spirit around her. Uh, yes. she was she was the most excited uh, the, the spirit the, the most active spirit, I guess, um, in the whole in the whole group. So, so this was my question coming out of my class. Um, where did this come from? Right? It just doesn't make sense that 
a religious movement starts from nothing and gets hundreds of thousands of adherents in a decade. Clearly, this was building on people's desires and interests and, and things before that. And I'm not, I'm not the first person to notice that. Other, other historians have talked about the antecedents to Sam's spiritualism. But they've really focused on those couple of decades before 1848, looking at the 1830s and 1840s. And they've focused on um, things that are really quite marginal movements. So they look at the followers of Emanuel Swedenborg, um, who is a European who spoke with angels in the 18th century, and the Swedenborgian church um, emerged from that, people who, who read his uh, conversations with angels, learned about the heavenly spheres and things like that. Tiny movement in the United States. 850 members of Swedenborgian churches in the 1840s. So this is one of the places that historians look at and say, oh, this is, this is where spiritualism came from, is Swedenborg or the Shakers. Um, Shakers were a larger movement than, uh, than Swedenborg, the Swedenborgian movement. But still, in the 18 or so communities from New Hampshire to Kentucky um, in the 1830s, 1840s, there's maybe 4,000 Shakers. They did get a lot of attention through things like this Courier and Ives print and people visiting them and such. So their, their, their influence goes beyond um, 4,000 members. But still, marginal, understood by the vast majority of mainstream Protestants to be just you know, out there, strange, discourse around them. And the American version of mesmerism, which emerged in 18th century Europe, was most popular in, the, in revolutionary France. Uh, this is an image from 1795, a European manifestation of that. But in the 1830s, mesmerism comes to the United States and has a, a, a minor boom. Um, and, you know, again, there's some thousands of individuals who are excited by this. There's a few journals. There's some societies and things like that. But again, mostly uh, quite large. And two of these three movements that I've described, Swedenborgianism and Mesmerism, are very strongly male. It's really mostly men who are involved, who are the Mesmerists um, and uh, the Swedenborgians. Only Shakerism is uh, as a strong female, obviously founded by Anne Lee, um, etc. So that's, that's where previous historians said spiritualism came from. It just didn't make sense to me that these really tiny, marginal movements could explain the origins of something so large as, as spiritualism. So I started to look for examples of people communicating with the dead or um, imagining communication with the dead in various <coughs> sources in the 19th century. So I started looking... Um, in places that historians have looked at, things like ghost literature, ghost stories, both fiction and, 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 um, and things that are reported as kind of straight ghost narratives. But then other places like um, funeral hymns. It turns out that many funeral hymns represent the dead speaking or speak to the dead. People will sing to the dead person uh, in front of them. Um, uh, uh, there's parlor songs. This is the beginning of the time when, when Americans started to buy, to purchase um, pianos, middle class Americans, upper middle class Americans started to purchase pianos for their homes and they'd buy sheet music to sing songs. You didn't even need a piano to, to, to sing together. People would buy sheet music anyway. Um, and a number of these parlor songs represented the dead as speaking or spoke to the dead. So I started saying, huh, this, is, this seems to be a broader, uh, a, a broader phenomenon. I looked back in the 18th century and found a lot of uh, imaginative literature, elegies of, of funeral poems were written in the voice of the dead, representing the dead speaking. Um, gravestones often, the epitaphs often were in the voice of the dead, representing the dead speaking. Um, uh, there's there's uh, the graveyard school of English prose and poetry in the middle of the 18th century, things like the grave and uh, Gray's elegy and such like. And then back into the 17th century, ghost stories, witchcraft narratives, um, 17th century funeral elegies and things like that. So clearly, 
there was much broader interest in communicating with the dead or representing what it would be like to communicate with the dead uh, in fictional sources. So at this point, I decided that I was writing what I was going to call a prehistory of spiritualism, which is a locution that I eventually dropped. Um, sometimes I still use it kind of casually to describe what I've, what I've done to people, but, but it just turns out to be too teleological of a description because the, the things I'm talking about aren't leading to, oops, aren't, I don't want to zap this thing out of this moment, um, aren't leading to <coughs> spiritualism in any kind of direct line. What I'm finding are a variety of ways that people are interested in imagining the dead, maintaining relationships with the dead, representing those imagined, continuing relationships with the dead. Um, so I, I, I dropped the, 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 the prehistory, but I was just tracing essentially 300 years of Protestant interest in communication with the dead. And that proves to be an important aspect of this story. Um, so this is going to require a little bit of theology. Don't be scared. Um, to understand uh, uh, why this is especially important to think about um, uh, 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 Protestant attitudes toward the dead. So before the Reformation, um, uh, late medieval Catholics, uh, purgatory, for, for late medieval Catholics, purgatory was a central part of their piety. This was the place to which almost all souls went after death. Only the absolutely evil or the absolutely saintly went to either hell or heaven, respectively. The vast majority of souls went to purgatory, where their souls were uh, purged by fire, where the sin was purged, uh, until, as you can see, eventually they're, they're able to escape purgatory and, and, and get into heaven. So it was a temporary place for the vast majority of souls. But the importance of it in late medieval Catholicism was <coughs> the living were able to maintain a relationship with the dead. Not only were able to, but were expected to. So the actions of the living could help the dead get out of purgatory, the souls of the dead, get out of the purgatory more quickly and into heaven. So praying for the dead helped their souls escape purgatory more quickly. Paying for masses for the dead. Um, endowing a chantry if you, were, uh, uh, um, if you were especially wealthy, a place where was really dedicated to praying uh, for the dead. Um, so there were actions of the living that influenced the dead, and then the dead themselves would return the favor. They would pray for you from purgatory. So late medieval Catholicism had this idea of a, of a relationship between the living and the dead. Um, uh, so much so that Natalie Zeman Davis famously described the dead as an age group in mm -hmm. Late medieval Catholicism. You had the youth, you know, you had uh, uh, people of, uh, of kind of adult age, the elderly, and the dead. They were just another group in society who, who were there and active. Um, Protestant Reformation comes along, conventionally dated to starting in 1517 with Martin Luther posting his 95 Theses. Martin Luther, interestingly, actually held on to purgatory for a while. Um, uh, he liked purgatory. Uh, he thought it was a useful way of connecting the living and the dead. But ultimately, it was other reformers in the 1520s who convinced him that, that really there's no scriptural basis for it. That was a huge part of the Protestant Reformation, was trying to get rid of those aspects of Catholicism that were seen as unscriptural. Uh, it's a very political <coughs> term, but that's how Protestants uh, saw it. Um, and, uh, and, and it was supposed to, Protestantism, uh, as formulated by, by Martin Luther, was supposed to focus on God's omnipotence, uh, grace through, uh, uh, salvation through God's grace alone, through God's uh, uh, actions alone, um, and purgatory just didn't just didn't fit with that. So by 1530, he's abandoned purgatory, and so for the next, well, starting then, Protestantism, official uh, 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 Orthodox Protestant <laughs> theology, maintained that there was there could not be a relationship between the living and the dead. The living were not supposed to pray for the dead. Um, uh, uh, the dead could not help the living. Persons, when a person died, their soul immediately went to either hell or heaven. That was determined by God before time, and you couldn't do anything about that as a living person. So it's severed, theoretically, it's severed that relationship between the living and the dead. Okay. So then, in the next 
six chapters of my book. Um, I talk about how that unfolds over the next couple of hundred of years um, with um, both Protestant ministers and lay people showing much more interest in maintaining relationships with the dead than this theoretical picture of Protestantism would lead us to believe. So uh, I have a quote from a recent book about um, a recent book about the Reformation, a big 700 page you know, book about the Reformation. And it says, Protestantism ended, how's it put it? It ended all intimacy and relations with the dead. Right? And that's based on a reading of the prescriptive literature of Luther and especially Calvin um, and other reformers. Um, but it, it wasn't as simple as that. And it was not as simple as lay people holding on to Catholic ideas while their ministers were out against them. Ministers themselves were uh, in, interested in relationships with the dead in certain ways, um, representing them, especially in funeral elegies, and in their pastoral duties. I mean, ministers had to sit by people's deathbeds, right? They had to comfort the, the grieving, the bereaved. Um, in those duties, they were, they, they offered a gentler line than Calvin did in his prescriptive writings. Okay, so I then, so I, I'm skipping over uh, a couple of centuries. Um, and basically what the book describes is over those couple of centuries, over the seventh course of the 17th and 18th centuries, the emergence of, by what, the, by, by what in the 19th century, I call Protestant cult of the dead. So there's there's all sorts of interest in representing the dead, uh, representing relationships with the dead in the 17th, 18th century. But by the 19th century, it has coalesced into something even stronger, where um, these a lot of these relationships go from the realm of the imaginative. So like the kind of funeral elegies that Cotton Mather. I mean, Cotton Mather wrote elegies representing the dead speaking. He was not saying, he was not claiming to be a medium. Right? He was not claiming to have the voice, but he was imagining that, and I think that that's important. But by the 19th century, people, uh, especially lay people, and in particular women, were maintaining relationships with the dead in a variety of ways that I think deserves the, um, the, uh, the, the term cult of the dead. I want to say very clearly that I'm using, I'm not using the, the modern sense of cult as a religion that is an OED's phrase, uh, strange or was it, strange or bizarre or something like that. Um, like the cult that my parents thought I was going to join when I went to college. <laughs> I, I was like, <coughs> maybe I seemed especially vulnerable. But like, oh, that <laughs> That's not the cult we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of religious studies definition of a cult as a um, uh, uh, veneration of a particular figure, right? So the cult of the Virgin Mary, cult of the saints, things like that. Uh, I think this deserves the, the, the term, a, a cult of the dead. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about what the cult of the dead was, the Protestant cult of the dead in the 19th century. I'm, you're going to notice that all of my examples are women. I didn't have to cherry pick that. They formed the, the, the vast majority of individuals I was able to identify as, as participants in the Protestant cult of the dead. And at the end, I'll have sort of two brief, uh, uh, entirely too brief um, uh, explanation of why I, some of the reasons why I think women uh, predominated in this cult of the dead. Okay, so I see five tenets of the cult of the dead. Um, first, that corpses deserved adoration. And I'm going to go back through all these in greater length in a moment. Um, second, that souls became angels. Third, that those souls could return as guardian angels. That burial grounds were a place that were especially likely to produce uh, encounters with these souls. And that prayers to the dead were legitimate. So let me go through all of these in turn. That corpses deserve adoration. This was, as I said, a, a key aspect of the Protestant Reformation was that people were, were not supposed to pray to the dead. Coffins were expected to be closed upon the death of an individual person, uh, and the, the, the coffin was kept in the house for a few days just to make sure they weren't knocking in there to, to get out. Those cases of uh, apparent death, which is a real thing in this period. Um, 
other thing my students get very excited about. Um, <laughs> we read Poe about uh, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was also very excited about that. Um, and uh, uh, so, but you weren't supposed to be paying any attention to the corpse. You were supposed to venerate the corpse and it was, uh, according to Protestants. Uh, but over the course of the 18th century, especially into the 19th century, people became much more interested uh, in viewing the corpse. By the end of the 18th, by the latter part of the 18th century, um, open coffins are become more common. Um, this is a 19th century co uh, coffin with a viewable, with a little view um, window, viewing window. There were other hinged ones that had a hinged top so you could view the person's face. This is the age, in the 19th century, this is the, this is what uh, historians have called the age of the beautiful death. This is something that you would encounter in things like Uncle Tom's Cabin. The, the, the death of little Eva is considered the sort of uh, apotheosis of uh, the age of the beautiful death. Corpses are beautiful, they're not putrid, uh, little Eva doesn't die, she just falls asleep, she's rosy, her lips are pink and bow shaped, it's a charming People sang songs about Little Eva. So this is the age of the beautiful death. People are very interested in corpses. Now historians have known that. What they haven't paid as much attention to is the, the, the religious connotations of that communion with the corpse. And I was able to access this through the kind of sources I'm going to be talking about now for the rest of the paper are mostly women's diaries, um, many of them in manuscripts, some of them published as sort of exemplars of female piety. So here is Elizabeth Pierce um, describing her grandmother's uh, uh, corpse in 1826. I never saw anything so heavenly as her appearance when she was placed in the coffin. She seemed to smile and say, now I am going to sleep sweetly in the grave, as I told you before. And so she imagines this conversation with the dead woman. The woman's in her parlor, her grandmother's in her parlor for, parlor for three days, and Elizabeth can barely sleep during those three days. She's having such powerful religious experiences. She describes it as a golden chain. Her, the body, she describes the body as a golden chain connecting herself, Elizabeth, to heaven. <coughs> and there are, and I have dozens and dozens of other examples of, 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 of like that. But that's the kind of that's the kind of religious communion that people, that some people experience that, that individuals who I consider to be participants in the Protestant cult of the dead experience when they were in close proximity to corpses. Okay, so souls became angels. This is kind of a standard idea today. If you go to any card store, you'll see the angel paraphernalia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's hard for people to imagine that, that this was not always a part of Christian belief, um, but the, the belief through the 18th century was that God that, that that angels and human souls are separate supernatural beings? God created angels before time. They're supernatural race. That they are messengers. That's what angels means. They are messengers that communicate uh, uh, that, 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 that communicate between heaven and earth. The souls of individuals in heaven are sometimes referred to as saints. Um, uh, 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 in other terms, but, but they're understood as separate from angels. In the 18th century, I, my first, um, my first uh, evidence that I found is 1697. Over the course of the 18th century, some lay people, in particular women, started talking about souls becoming angels um, in heaven. Um, until by the time, by the, by the 19th century that I'm talking about, this became a much more common kind of understanding. Um, and by that time, and you start to see it, you start to see it in some ministerial writing um, by the middle of the 19th century. So there's representations of souls as angels. And the thing I like about this picture is that it shows how close by the souls are imagined to be. So there's, there's our houses, there's like 50 feet of sky, clouds, and angels. So angels are seen as being, uh, these souls as angels are seen as being very nearby, whoops, um, and thus potentially interacting with us. And that's how we get to the third point, which is the idea that souls could be guardian angels. Now guardian angels have a really long lineage that go back before Christianity. Christianity took from, 
Ju uh, from Judaism and other Near Eastern ancient religions. Um, uh, so, so guardian angels are kind of a central part of, of Christianity, um, but where people started to differ with mainstream Orthodox uh, Protestantism over the course of the 18th century was this idea that guardian angels were returned souls as opposed to the separate race of God-created angels. So here's a kind of characteristic frontispiece from a, a, a 1850s text showing uh, these two little charming children and the guardian angels who are watching over them. So the thing that's distinctive in the 19th century is the idea that people's, that the, the souls of their loved ones are returning to serve this purpose. So uh, one of many examples that I have, this is from the diary of Anna Eliza Heath, uh, a young woman, she was 28, 1825, and her sister died. Her sister was eight years younger than her. She was 20 years old, and Anna uh, really blamed herself for her sister's death. She couldn't make it to her sister's deathbed. I felt all sorts of guilt about that. And over the course of the next <coughs> couple of years, has a series of intense experiences where Anna's sister Mary, the deceased, the soul of the deceased Mary, is present with her, is giving her comfort, and she continues to she Anna continues to communicate with Mary uh, after her death. So that happens once in church, uh, after which she wrote. Quote, almost, and I believe the very last time I was there, Mary accompanied me to church, and she seemed to be present with me now. This is the time she goes actually with her uncle, who's 65 years old, kind of a stern figure, and it's the first time that Mary's returning to this church since the death of, I'm sorry, that Anna's returning to this church since the death of Mary, and she's getting very emotional, but her stern uncle doesn't want her to be crying, so she's trying to hold this in, and Mary seemed to be present with her at that moment. So her, her soul was present with her to, um, to help her through this difficult, to help her through this difficult time. Two weeks later at home, quote, it is a delightful idea that departed spirits are commissioned by God to execute purposes of mercy on earth, and that you, now speaking directly to her dead sister, and that you are present with us, though invisible, active in accomplishing errands of love. So I see this as one of the key tenets of the Protestant cult of the dead, this idea that you, that the dead, are, are, are present, though invisible. Right? They're, they're around us. We can't see them, um, uh, but they're there. And this, if for the religious studies people in the audience, or the religious studies person in the audience, I don't know, uh, okay, there are plenty of people, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, this is where I, um, I interact with uh, Robert Orsi's recent book, History and, History and Presence. Um, so Robert Orsi is a very well-known religious scholar. Um, he's been writing about presence uh, for a couple of decades. He studies American Catholicism, um, which is, you know, is more, it's more obviously a religion of presence than Protestantism is. So by presence, he's describing the relationships between humans and what he calls suprahuman beings. So in 20th century Catholicism, you know, things like Marian apparitions, prayers to St. Jude, all these things make Catholicism very <coughs> readily legible as a religion of presence. And in his book, History and Presence, he talks about Protestantism, that saying that that concept of Protestantism, the concept of presence should be applied to Protestantism as well, but he doesn't do that. He's, he's a historian of Catholicism. So that's one of the things I've taken up uh, in, in my work, uh, in a separate article that I've published in history, um, is showing how this idea of presence is actually really useful for understanding um, uh, aspects of Protestantism. In particular, I mean, both of these, um, both of these quotations, she uses that, that very word, present. Her, her sister, her deceased sister, is present with her. So I argue that Protestantism is likewise a religion of presence, a religion with relationships between humans and superhuman beings, in addition to God and Christ, which are usually the only ones that are imagined as being Protestant uh, superhuman beings. So that's the religious studies contribution of this, uh, of this concept. Okay, so the fourth thing, that 
these souls were especially likely to appear in burial grounds. And in this period, uh, when people talk about uh, antebellum burial grounds, they get very excited about the so-called rural cemetery movement, of which Forest Lawn in Buffalo is an exemplar. The rural, the rural cemetery movement started in 1831 with Mount Auburn in uh, Cambridge, just outside of Boston. They were called rural cemeteries because they were outside of the city center. Um, they, they were beautifully landscaped. Um, uh, um, they, they were beautifully landscaped, um, included paths for walking, and they, they were really parks. They were parks before urban parks. Um, they preceded Central Park and the, and the parks of the 19th century. Um, so Buffalo's Forest Lawn was outside the city center. That was when the city was First Ward, Canal Side, down to deep downtown, um, and uh, but really, rural cemeteries were kind of a just a side note in this period. They were important as they, they started to emerge in the 1830s. Um, but there were for every rural cemetery there were a hundred churchyards like this. I just picked this one kind of at random to show two things. One of them, this is New Haven's Grove Street Cemetery, which is actually kind of a modern one. Um, we won't. I, if you if you're a, if you're a history of cemetery nerd like me, we can talk about the details. But um, during Q and A, I just want to show two things here. One is the density of the uh, of the burials. This is characteristic of churchyards um, in uh, uh, the Northeast and Northern United States, um, and also the the, um, the proximity of the city, right there. Right, the churchyard is right in the city, and so. When people had powerful religious experiences with the spirits of the deceased, this was right in the middle of their lives. They didn't have to make a special trip out to Forest Lawn or Mount Auburn or Mount Hope in Rochester. Uh, this was something that they'd pass going, going to church or just passing by um, in, their da in their daily lives. This is one of, uh, of dozens of quotes I could have brought for you. Uh, this is a woman going to her uh, mother's grave. <clears throat> the grave of a mother. Oh, what a spot for a child to visit and reflect. I could linger all night by her side. It seemed as if her pure spirit was hovering around me while I sat weeping on the green turf. And so this was a very common form of devotion, I argue, for, the, for participants in the Protestant cult of the dead, was to go to graveyards, sit often sit, sometimes to lay on the grave. I've got several examples of people describing laying on top of the grave, separated from the deceased, moldering remains um, by only a few feet, and um, thinking, contemplating, experiencing the presence uh, uh, of the dead. And then finally, uh, and perhaps most surprisingly for people, who, and maybe most controversial, I've gotten some pushback about this, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna insist that what these people are doing is praying to the dead, um, and I'll let you decide. Um, uh, people haven't liked this when I've presented this in, in a variety of other places and tried to say, oh, it's not really prayers to the dead. It's more like uh, the literary device of apostrophe, um, uh, which is what I talk about a lot in the book about in things like elegies where people are apostrophizing the dead, speaking to the dead. Um, uh, but in the 19th century, there are, I think, forms of communication that people express. I have them in written form, um, uh, uh, but they, I think that they deserve the categories of prayer, which, which prayer has a variety of definitions, a variety of definitions, um, but, uh, but I, one good general definition is um, communication with supernatural beings. It's a good general definition that does it. There's some definitions that are kind of marred by a Protestant bias, like um, communication with the divine, uh, as if there's one divine. Anyway, anyway. Um, so, the, so I have lots and lots of written examples of prayers to the dead. Um, people, especially women, describing, <clears throat> uh, writing directly to the dead in their, in their diaries, praying to them. Um, but I'm going to focus on some material evidence for you because I think that this it does a good job of showing 
how the kind of research I did was able to supplement what historians previously knew. So what historians previously knew is that things like this existed. Um, mourning jewelry, mourning portraiture. This is an 18th century ring. It's actually really tiny um, uh, from the Victorian Albert Museum. It's only an inch. It's not that tiny for a ring, um, but uh, it's only an inch in height. And it shows the soul of young Eliza Clark uh, emerging from her grave, being going up to heaven, and her enraptured mother there uh, watching along. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is a very common kind of uh, uh, mourning uh, uh, jewelry. This is mourning portraiture. Uh, this is actually a miniature. Uh, mourning portraiture would have been uh, uh, something that only the, the upper middle class could uh, could indulge in, especially something like this miniature. This is on ivory, um, and it's uh, the detail on it is, is extraordinary. It's, it's only like this. It's only like this big. But these are the family's three living children and their two dead ones, hovering above, very present in the kind of way I'm describing. There's only like a millimeter on the original between the dead the older dead sibling and the older living sibling. Um, so, and those, those figures, I argue, are, they are ready to communicate. Right? I'll just remind you of this spiritualist, uh, spirit photographing from spiritualism. But this is the sort of thing that uh, I argue compares to that. So these, people, historians have known about these for a long time. Um, but what they haven't known about is how people have interacted with these, right? What's the response of people? That's impossible to get. Well, it's actually not impossible to get. If you read lots and lots of diaries by, especially by women uh, in the 19th century, there's people who describe their actual relationships with these images. And so I've, I've got just a couple for you. A woman in New York City, um, I have the year somewhere, uh, in the late of this, I guess, 1830s, um, she wrote a poem called Lines Suggested by Looking at the Portrait of My Beloved Husband. This was seven years after his death. Um, this was um, a, a poem of 36 lines. These are just words. Uh, Six lovely babes to us were given. So she's speaking to her husband. Three passed before thee into heaven. Those dear loved ones thou now hast joined. Three with thy widow left behind. So I argue that this is a prayer to the dead. She's speaking to the dead person. She's communicating with her husband in heaven. She's saying six children were given to us. Three of them died before you went to heaven. Um, then you went. Three are left behind with me. Um, she's doing this while looking at the portrait of her husband. Similarly, uh, 1833, um, she's looking at the, at the portrait. My George, my love, as I gaze upon thy portrait, and cannot refrain from calling upon thee. How thankful amidst all my sorrow do I feel that thou art at rest, where no sorrow can assail thee, and where thou art I humbly hope at rest. Again, she's praying to the dead. She's using the, the, the archaic language of the King James Bible, the thy and the thou, to signal that this is religious communication, this is communication with the supernatural. So, the methodological point I just want to make briefly, um, I harp on this more when I'm talking to, to graduate students or undergraduates, is, is the value of looking at sources beyond the easy ones to find. It's easy to find what the ministers are saying. That stuff's all published. We have that all here at UB in various databases. Our Early American Imprints has everything published in the United States up to 1800. You can find things on Google Scholar. Um, uh, but if, but in reading the, the, the words of especially women that they left behind in these manuscript diaries, um, we can learn about how people actually um, uh, thought about these things. Okay, as I said, I'm, I'm leaving this to the end um, and just going to suggest to you why, why this appealed so much more to women in this period than men. There were, there were men who I consider to be participants in the cult of the dead, and men who did all of these, all of these five things. I, I don't know these are all of them, but the, the, the evidence is just disproportionately in favor of women. Um, uh, 
And some of that is an artifact of the sources um, and the kinds of ways uh, that uh, men wrote about themselves versus the way women wrote about themselves. But I, I don't think that that's, the, that's the, the whole story. So let me just give you a few explanations and then I'll throw it open to questions and we can, we can discuss this more and I'll offer more input on this in particular. So women had, in the Western tradition, had long been associated with caring for the dying and for the dead. Women uh, bathed, uh, women took, took care of, uh, of people as they were dying. They bathed the dead, um, they shrouded the corpse. Um, very wealthy families might give that to female servants to do, uh, but for the vast majority of families, it's family members who are doing that. Women are also heavily uh, involved in grief work, in memory, in maintaining memory, in expressing grief, in maintaining rituals of grieving. Um, and so this is just a very old story in Western Europe uh, and North America that women are associated with those things. So there's nothing in particular new about that. Some of the things that are new to the period that I'm looking at are uh, families begin to get smaller. This, is, this begins with upper middle class urban families and then we'll filter out to, to other families uh, lower down the, the social scale. But um, there's some degree of family limitation going on. Um, more men are working outside the home. Again, this is a trend led by up middle and upper middle class urban families that we, that we move outside. As men are moving outside the home, women are more so more closely associated with the domestic sphere, and in particular, are more um, in charge of inculcating children with piety. So women. That, that was a duty that, for, for the Puritans, men and women shared the education of their children in religious matters. By the 19th century, women are really in charge of that, so women are more and more associated with, um, uh, with maintaining the, the, um, uh, the, the piety of the household. This is a very broad cultural shift, but in, by the 19th century, there's new ideas about companionate marriage, about affectionate parent-child relations, so there's more emotion in these relations, or I should say, uh, um, ex uh, emotion is more readily expressed, it's seen to be um, uh, more, um, uh, it's um, seen to be more desirable to express those kinds of emotions. At the same time, mortality rates remain extremely high. There's really almost no reduction in infant and childhood mortality the first half of the 19th century compared to earlier periods. So this in, the intense investment that women are placing in their children um, and their families more broadly is, is, is accompanied by, I would argue, even higher levels of anxiety about the prospect of death um, and then the emotions that are raised when, uh, uh, when children and spouses die. Over the course of the 18th century, there's a growth in print culture, um, and in particular, uh, toward the end of the 18th century into the 19th century with the rise of female academies, women are, are, are more educated, they're reading, uh, they're, they're reading more. So, this, uh, so the, the print culture of the 18th century, which is starting to um, uh, embody, this really comes from uh, Europe first, ideals of sympathy, Sympathy and sensibility become watchwords for the literate middle classes in the late uh, 18th and 19th century. The expression of emotion um, becomes um, uh, more uh, uh, normalized. Um, and sentimental literature uh, encourages emotional expression. So people are reading in imaginative literature characters expressing great emotion and mourning. we are adopting these uh, more expressive styles of mourning. At the same time, um, there's a, this is a big, a big story that I'll allude to in one quick bullet point, but, but Calvinism, Protestantism is moving away from Calvinism um, and uh, is becoming more Arminian. Uh, the belief that that uh, the living can um, uh, help determine whether their souls go to heaven uh, or not. That uh, uh, increases uh, the agency of, uh, uh, 
of believers um, and is connected to uh, these uh, rituals of, um, uh, of war. Okay, so the uh, I'll go back to that in case people are still writing some of those things down. So that's just, as I said, a ridiculously schematic and fast sketch of why women are at the center of this. But the larger interpretive point I'm trying to make is that women drove theological change in 19th century Protestantism. And this is something that historians have really ignored. Um, when, when, when historians talk about things like the decline of Calvinism and Protestantism, um, they, they look to male ministers, revivalists, Charles Grandison Finney, etc., etc. Um, they don't talk about uh, the actions of ordinary female believers um, uh, and how their ideas about their relationships with the dead drove the, um, the creation of this uh, cult of the dead and really changed the landscape of Protestantism, thus setting the stage for the spiritualism and stuff that I started with. So I'm going to get there. Yeah. Great talk, really interesting. Um, I want to buy one of the books. Um, <laughs> so, so an image that I was expecting to see, which I didn't see, uh, when I uh, used to teach in Kentucky, and I went to the Mary Todd Lincoln House, which was in Lexington, mm. and I went in, and I was totally shocked to see hair portraits. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and it got me thinking about the actual material body mm -hmm. and how it fits into your story. Yeah. Because because if, if souls can become angels, do they still need their body? Is mm -hmm. there still What's the relationship yeah. between That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the hair wreaths that you saw and that other people have seen at, at various historic houses wherever here in Western New York and elsewhere. There's, there's a few great ones at the uh, at the uh, Genesee Country Museum, a collection of houses out in Genesee County. Um, uh, those are those are after 1848. That's a that's a that's a post uh, post Civil War phenomenon. The elaborate hair wreaths. And what most people don't know is that they were mostly sent out to professionals. Um, so you would send the hair of your deceased loved one out to young women in Rhode Island who worked together, and because this was hard work to create this incredibly elaborate hair. This isn't the sort of thing that that any old you know eighteen year old girl can do. This is, it, um, so that's actually a post Civil War phenomenon. But in the book, there's a lot. I, I write a lot about hair um, because in the in a lot of that jewelry that I was showing you, there's hair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the this on uh, on my book, uh, my book cover. Um, this is also a piece of jewelry, um, and I love it because it shows it shows the young woman bursting forth from her grave. This is a brooch. The other one was a ring. This is a little, this would have been a little locket sort of thing, um, and she's she's bursting out of the grave. Her mother is delighted. The artist has done this incredible representation. This is ivory, and he's like broken this piece of ivory and included it there to show how eager she is to get out. She's busting out of this grave, right? Um, can you see this down here? Oh, it's a little bit like textury. Can you see this corner? That's her hair, chopped hair mixed with paint. So the mother would wear this locket around her uh, uh, around mm -hmm. her neck, and so pressed against her bosom would be this image of her daughter, image of her daughter bursting out of the grave, communicating with the mother, with the actual physical remains of, of, of her daughter there. So there were a lot, a lot of mourning jewelry um, from this period, incorporated hair. Some of it was just woven hair, hair woven into bracelets, others just locks of hair um, in the back. Uh, you know, a locket would have a little space where you could put the hair. In it, a lot of those um, uh, 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 photographs of corpses. So that there were there were portraits that I showed you of, of deceased children. When photography is invented in the 1840s, um, the uh, um, people take pictures of the corpses of their children, especially those were those frames often had hair in it. Um, so people were very interested in using that hair as a way to remember the dead, as a way to keep that corpse nearby. I've got examples of people cutting off uh, the, the Jocelyn family, middle-class Jocelyn family in New Haven. Um, all six members cut 
locks of their own hair when little Ike dies at age five and put it in his hands so he can take that with him to heaven. Right? Theologically logical or not, that's that's what they wanted that's what they wanted to do. So that so the hair, that that desire to maintain a connection with the dead through the bodily remains is powerful, even though um, you know, if, if they thought about it, they would say, well, little Ike isn't actually going to bring that hair with him. But they wanted to put it in his hands in the coffin to symbolize that connection. It has some power of being a relic of some way. That... And, they use, and a lot of people use the term relic in this period. And so I want to be careful to distinguish between Protestant relic belief and Catholic relic belief, mm -hmm. because these Protestants don't believe that you can, that, that, that being close to that, that, um, that uh, hair or bone gives them power to inter, for the dead to intercede with them. There are different beliefs, but they do use that term. They suggested that some of these Protestants do believe that. They believe something, something like it, but it's, di but it's, di but it is different. It is different. And in fact, the belief in intercession <clears throat> is one of the things that, for the most part, divides Protestants from Catholics. I've got a couple of examples of Protestants praying to the dead and asking for something like intercession. But it's, it's a couple of examples out of you know the hundreds of diaries. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, it's fascinating. Um, so when I teach um, um, comparative religion to some Muslim communities in Africa in my classes, one of the um, <laughs> Some gray areas that I struggle with students are trying to uh, distinguish uh, or sometimes collapse the distinctions between, you know, ATRs, African traditional religions, and Christianity or Islam. Mm -hmm. Is the emphasis on, you know, polytheism in the other mm -hmm. and, and monotheism in the other. And mm -hmm. therefore, they are still at the point of colonial encounter to uh, define all manifestations of polytheism as paganism, animism, or ancestor worship, mm -hmm. or the funerary rites. Um, and so these have been features, right, in African traditional religious practices that has been identified to order mm -hmm. and to distinguish it as not a true religion, mm -hmm. but rather belonging in the realm of magic. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. thinking of Max Weber, sort of mm -hmm. classification. Yep, of, yep, yep. Um, but here we have these uh, these of practices that resonate you know, significantly mm -hmm. with a lot of the practices you find in African traditional religion, mm -hmm. and it got me thinking while you were speaking. Who, so, whose protest Protestantism <laughs> are you? This you know does the book capture? Right. So there is sort of the um, perhaps a, a male-led official clerical. Mm -hmm notion of what Protestantism was. Mm -hmm. And then you have these popular um, Protestant, protest, Protestantism mm -hmm. in early America. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, so uh, is there conflict no, or is I there? I hear exactly, I hear yeah. exactly what you're saying. I, I want to be- Or have we been shown one and, and then the other yeah. is sort of effaced yeah. from the yeah. narrative of what mm -hmm. Protestantism yeah. has been? No, there's a lot of smart things going on what you're asking. There's a, the, there's a couple of things I, I want to be a little careful about. I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, this talk is focused on a division between um, between lay and ministerial yeah. versions of Protestantism, uh, and that's not really the whole story of the book. Um, there are moments, as I suggested by alluding to Cotton Mather and other mm -hmm. things, where where where, the, where Protestant ministers are very interested in the supernatural world. In fact, in, in Restoration England, in the second half of the 17th century in England. The leading ghost hunters were all ministers. Um, so Joseph Glanville um, was the leading ghost hunter in Restoration England. Henry Moore, uh, Richard Baxter, Cotton Mather, Increase Mather. Um, they're all interested in ghosts because ghosts prove the reality of the spirit world against Thomas Hobbes. And that's the, you know, the, the, the bete noir, the, the Hobbism. Uh, or Sadducism. Um, so, um, so I don't want to. I don't want to make it. I don't want to. Uh, uh, the book is not about a, a, a lay 
Protestantism versus the ministerial Protestantism, except in this moment where there is more divergence on some of these topics um, than others. Now, as I said, there are, there are ministers in this period who do begin to imagine uh, 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 relations with the dead like this, and when they're talking about their when they're talking about their own loved ones, they're more likely to sound like this than when they're when they're um, preaching to. And so it's it, so the colonial encounter is a perfect example of that, where it inspires certain theorists to theorize these differences between the movements or between the religions, the African traditional religions and Protestantism in ways that are that are very schematic and theoretical, really, just like just like theoretical Calvinism. Right? According to theoretical Calvinism, you can't know whether a loved one has gone to heaven or hell. You can't. There's no way to know. When the person dies well or dies poorly, God decided that before time. Nothing you can do can change it, and you can't know. And Calvin said, he didn't know for sure, but taking a guess, I'd say that one out of a hundred people go to heaven, <laughs> and 99 go to hell. He's like, it could be more, could be less. <clears throat> and both ministers and lay people act as if that is just not true. They do not think, they do not hold to Calvin's 1%. <laughs> the religion of the one percent. Okay. So, uh, so, so that so so there's a theoretical Protestantism that that, that here is posit, and the colonial encounters are perfect. It's a perfect moment for them to to imagine these sharp differences. Right? There's an incentive for them to imagine those sharp differences um, when the when the reality is obviously much more much more complicated. Yeah. I see so many hands. Mary? Well, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, space and souls. Mm -hmm. So um, you have that um, that people feel like they can commune with the dead um, when they're in grave sites, uh, perhaps closer to the body. And I know you have some quotes of, of people feeling like when their loved one was in the coffin downstairs in the parlor room, that there was a connection mm -hmm. there. But certainly when we get to Fox, the Foxes, I believe that, that they're saying that they're detecting a ghost that potentially had died or had connection with that particular that house, house and they had moved yeah. into it. Yes. Um, so is there like a particular rupture that happens when when the soul gets less attached to kind of the material body and goes to place instead? Yeah, so place is really important in this story. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I came up with a term um, in uh, in this book. There's, there's an old Catholic term called uh, burial ad sanctos, burial near the saints. And every Catholic church has bones of saints in it. That's what's near the altar. Um, and uh, that's why burial within the church is uh, is mm -hmm. premium. Right? You, pay, you pay good money for that. If you're a regular person, you're buried outside the church. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're wealthy, you're buried within the church in medieval and, and early modern Catholicism. And then, and then later. Um, so you want to be buried near those relics because of the power of those relics. That's burial ad sanctus. Um, so I see a, par a parallel uh, uh, belief in Protestantism that I call burial ad familiaris, burial near the family. Mm -hmm. And because the, that proximity of both in burial, people want to be close together, and allow for people to come visit, mm -hmm. right? And so people will say, I'm moving away, I have one moment, I'm moving away from Eastport, Maine, where I will leave behind the bones of my children, to her great to her great regret. Um, uh, a woman moves to Hawkesbury, Ontario, on the frontier. It's a lumbering town in 1830, 40s when she moves there. Um, 400 miles from um, Leicester, Massachusetts, where she's from, um, and she's really upset to be leaving behind the bones of her uh, of her beloved husband Calvin, because of that idea about uh, of proximity. Now, I don't have any evidence of her in Hawkesbury imagining the spirit of her husband hovering mm -hmm. around her, but I would guess that the distance from his bones wouldn't have prevented that entirely, mm -hmm. but it would have prevented that one that one ritual of devotion mm -hmm. of going to the grave, going to the, the graveside mm -hmm. and imagining uh, the, the dead person. So, <coughs> so there is a there is a spatial connection, but um, but it's not. I don't think it's. It, I don't think it's. Uh, 
I don't think it's an insuperable obstacle mm -hmm. to you can overcome that. Right. Yeah, so this is a terrible question. Um, but so I'm always interested in cynicism. And if you think about um, like the the story the Re the Reformation story and um, why purgatory left the mm -hmm. sort of the Protestant theology, it's because the church was making a lot of money off of indulgences and people thought it saw it as like a really corrupt practice. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of using, playing off of people's sort of beliefs in the dead and, and making money. I wonder, is there any kind of um, similar or analogous or, or maybe different um, discourses of cynicism around the stuff that you're describing? I mean, were there people who were like, this is crazy, um, people are getting manipulated in all kinds of ways? Oh, um, well, absolutely with spiritualism. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, there's a fantastic, there's a, it's an incredibly interesting dy dynamic dyadic dynamic between spiritualism and its debunkers. Mm -hmm. It's like as soon as spiritualism emerges, its debunkers emerge as well. And in fact, when the when the Fox sisters advertised their, their first performance wasn't New York City in 1850, I left out their 1849 performance in Corinthian Hall in Rochester. And the advertisement they place in the newspaper says, um, it's, it's a bunch of questions. Are they communicating with the dead? Can they be believed? Are they credulous? See and see and inquire, mm. right? <laughs> and so it's it, it, it leads to this kind of you know speculative. And you know Houdini, as you as you know, was famously as, as you may know, was famously a debunker of spiritualism because he knew magic tricks. So he'd see that the, ta the table would be tipping, which was something that spirits could supposedly do in seances, and he'd say, "Aha! Here's the fishing line." Or here's the here's the little person hiding away in this cabinet who's doing the voices. And, um, so so with spiritualism, there's definitely that uh, that mm -hmm. kind of relationship. Um, with this, there's less because these women in the Protestant culture that they had before spiritualism, um, they're not doing this publicly. There's they don't they don't have a name for themselves. I've named them. I've grouped them together. Um, they might reject my grouping of them. Um, certainly not all of them believe all five of those tenets. Um, so and that, so that that uh, more private, these are things that they're that they're experiencing with their families in their homes in their diaries. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't set it up for debunking in the same kind of way. There is that uh, question of cynicism stuff though about ghost belief. That's a that's sort of the earlier mm -hmm. version, the earlier analog to, to spiritualism, where ghost belief goes from being something very mainstream in the in the you know 17th century to educated elites becoming more and more skeptical over time, um, and then um, by the 18th or 19th century, anytime you're going to try to introduce a ghost narrative, you have to account for that skepticism. So if you're going to try to convince someone that it's a real ghost encounter, you have to say. I understand that you know you've seen lots of fake ghost stories. Of course, most of our fake, but this one is real. I'm telling you. Um, so there, so there is that. There is that kind of relationship with, with that. Where did you find most of these diaries? Mm -hmm. um, there's there's uh, fantastic archives that, that people spend their lives mm -hmm. maintaining and allow us to go in for free, basically, and look at them. And so the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Rhode Island Historical Society, Connecticut Historical Society. Um, Rochester book, Rare Books and Manuscripts, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, um, uh, uh, New York Historical Society, but just uh, the Historical Society. So there's, there's great repositories. Uh, a decent number of uh, women's diaries, as I mentioned at the beginning, have been published. So uh, uh, an especially pious woman would die, and her husband or minister would take her diary that she had you know, composed in volumes and volumes over the course of decades and excerpt it for publication. And those are tricky sources because they've been, they've been edited, um, but to, to the extent that I can determine, the ministers or husbands almost never changed the entries when they published them. They would excerpt things out so you might not get certain kinds of uh, uh, certain kinds of things, but, but they're, pr they're pretty good. Uh, they're pretty good. Time. And you can get some of those 19th century ones on Google uh, Google Books as those uh, scan. Um, 
but most of it is is reading. Um, I mean, you know, you is just reading through lots of diaries, looking for, uh, and occasionally uh, an online catalog. Like if you search for uh, diaries, women diaries in mourning or grief, you'll get you'll get one. You get a hit, like, oh, I don't know to go to this one, but then there's like thirty one. Yeah. Eric, this is a fascinating talk, and I'm full of questions. I want to probably be able to ask them all, but. Um, first of all, I'll just point out with, with the notion of presence in the Islamic context, there's a word called hazadi, which means presence, which is exactly what uh, devotees use when they visit the shrines of saints. Uh, How would I translate H -A -Z -I -R -I, that? H-A-Z-I-R-I, and a great book on this is by Carla Bellamy, it's called The Everyday Ephemeral, uh, and I, she said CUNY, she's, she's, it's a really, really great ethnographic study of a set of shrines. Uh, visit those who, they, in this case, they get inhabited either by by early Muslim figures, their, their spirits, or by genies, uh, which is very mm -hmm. common in, in mm -hmm. Islamic context. And related to that, you know, I'm going to work everyday ephemeral. Everyday ephemeral. Gotcha. And, uh, and what I'm working on these days are, are cemeteries in, in India. Oh, cool. And what I'm noticing is that I'm looking for examples of the spoken language in, in public spaces. And so one of the interesting mm -hmm. things is that we find that women's graves have a, a much higher proportion of the spoken language being written on their tombstones. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's one of the only places that women could visit, uh, either with a, with a male child or with no male uh, mm -hmm. males in their family. So tombs and, and grave sites, mm -hmm. um, more so even than mosques. And so uh, when you see in the 19th century the growth of literacy, women could one woman could read out loud, but she wouldn't necessarily be trained in the classical languages, Arabic and Persian. And so that's that's sort of one impetus for writing this. But my, oh, my, so so you'll yeah. wanna you'll wanna read my I talk really in gravestones chapter. I, I um, because wait, yeah. there's a whole there's a whole chapter on this this tradition yeah. of, of gravestones representing the dead speaking the Right, right. And and so just the question I have is this eighteen twenty eight that Joseph Smith Starts publishing uh, the Book of Mormon. Book it's of, I think eighteen thirty one. Yeah, but you know he the decade before that he's hired in the same neighborhoods, mm -hmm. uh, looking for gold mm -hmm. using his divination. You know the seer stones, right? And so I'm just wondering if there's any you know, what 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 do you see with the seer stones uh, at, at that time, and, and how widespread is that practice? If we, I like this. It's neat to have this monogenesis of the, the Box sisters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you know, is there something about the burnt over country, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, was this, you know, is this an analogous or related set of phenomena? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll want to read the section on Mormons. Oh, okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I would say I would just I, we, twenty bucks. <laughs> 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 uh, I'll just I'll just uh, object to the the monogenesis because it's yeah. a multigenesis right. really. That I'm talking about, um, but yeah. So um, the the seer stone tradition is is a different tradition. It's very male, um, and it's. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're laying money down. <laughs> it's gonna, we're going to do it as a silent auction. Um, uh, and the sources for it are really hard to come by because it's a because it's an esoteric right. practice. Um, uh, Alan Taylor of, of famous Alan Taylor, who's now, you know, at the University of Virginia, he's written all sorts of books, but very early in his career, he, he wrote on Mormon seer stones um, and that practice. Um, so the, I guess the, the, the point that I would make is that the um, other people might know this phrase, but upstate New York in the 19th century was called the burned over district um, because during the Second Great Awakening, or the second big Protestant revival um, uh, in the 19th century, there's a, there's a frontier kind of component to the Second Great Awakening, which is, starts in 1801 in Kentucky. But then in the 1830s, after the building of the Erie Canal, um, a wave of revivalism sweeps across upstate New York um, and burns everything in its path, the lower district. And, and it's just a, an area of incredible religious ferment. And out of that arises Joseph Smith and the Mormons in Palmyra, New York, which is east of Rochester. Um, and eventually the Fox sisters, uh, and what the Millerites, uh, who believed that the world was ending in 1844 um, and got tens of thousands of people to, 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 to believe them. 
um, and since today is the Seventh Day Adventists. Um, so all of this, it's, it's just an, an incredible area of ferment. Um, we were we in Buffalo area are kind of on the margins of that. Rochester was kind of the epicenter, um, uh, but it's an area where a lot of these uh, uh, ideas were able to be expressed. And so Joseph Smith is drawing on lots of these traditions. And so the, the, the part of my book that, that what I talk about in my book when I talk about Mormons is their ritual of baptism, baptizing the dead. That's the aspect that I think draws on this longer tradition of interest in communication with the dead. So Mormons have a ritual. And this is why, if you've ever wondered why Mormons are so into genealogy, it's because if they can identify an ancestor, that person can be baptized posthumously into the Mormon church. Um, so Mormons are actually a huge boon for, actually before internet days, Mormons were fantastic for social historians like myself. You could go to a Mormon church, which would have a Mormon reading room, and they could get microfilms from, Saint, from Salt Lake City, which were like every church record in New England or New England, um, they gathered these things so that they could baptize the dead as Mormons, um, and so this is uh, that's that's the aspect of their of their religion that I think is really drawing on this particular uh, this particular strand. Yeah. Yes, um, I have a question about the way you're thinking about the relationship between the clergy and women mm -hmm. around these kinds of questions, and I, if I hear you correctly, I hear you kind of saying, well. Kind of official theology being preached in the churches, and there were um, women sort of, you know, generating this cult of the dead. And I'm wondering, like, what's your relationship to Ann Douglas's argument about that? Because she, um, I mean, you know, she really sees the clergy as in some way kind of in cahoots with the women mm -hmm. and yeah. corrupting yes. Protestantism yes. proper. And right. so I think she would agree with you that women drive theological change in the period, but obviously she sees that as a bad thing to be deplored yeah. and regretted and also sort of connected to um, the emergence of popular consumer culture. So I wonder, I mean, how would you, yeah, how yeah. do you distinguish your position on that from hers? Yeah, yeah. I think you do. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is about the feminization of American religion. Um, and it, it's a, it's a fantastic, important book, um, problematic in all sorts of ways. Um, in particular, in this idea that that the that the Protestantism that emerges in the, in the 19th century has lost its rigor, it does not have the rigor of Calvinism, and this is and Anne Douglas did not invent that. That is a lo old, long New England Protestant trope that Calvinism was the real religion, and it's it's stern, it's a stern, mm -hmm. tough religion, um, and. Uh, the religion that where people start to think that everyone can get into heaven, that's weak, feminine, wimpy, sentimental, sentimental. Mm -hmm. exactly. Indul uh, she calls it um, uh, therapeutic self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, and so Anne Douglas and many others writing in the 70s uh, and 80s talked about the, the, the change in, in Protestantism in the 19th century in these really judgmental terms. Um, as, a, as a decline from the rigor. So, so you're absolutely right that, that where I agree with her is in the importance of women in this story. Um, but for Ann Douglas, it's also about these kind of feminized, um, feminized cl clerical figures um, who are uh, driving the story. And in my, in, my, in my story by the 19th century, those feminized clerical figures are very much marginalized. They're not um, women are not really interacting with their ministers as they're formulating these ideas. Um, they're, um, they're coming up with them more or less on their own or independent of the kinds of sermons that, that they're hearing, uh, which are still, for the most part, those sermons are saying things like, um, uh, when a person dies, all communication with them ceases, um, things like that. I mean, do you see that as women in some ways carving out a space for religious authority that the conventional church context is not allowing them? Or, I mean, authority is is a tricky word for something so private, but but absolutely in terms of carving out a space. 
I completely believe that. And so what, the best journal that I have for praying to the dead is a 200-page spiritual journal by a woman named Sally Hersey. Um, uh, in, uh, she's the one who wound up in Hawkesbury, Ontario, um, or that I alluded to before. Um, as far as I can tell, no scholar has ever looked at this. Because these sources are, by traditional measures, boring as hell, right? It's sad, older women being sad and talking about religion. And historians have looked at this and said, this is not interesting. This is not worth spending a few days deciphering this bad handwriting. Um, and actually, if you read it, she's praying to her deceased son, her deceased husband, her deceased daughter, in all these incredibly interesting ways. She has this incredibly powerful religious series of religious experiences over decades that she documents in this diary um, that no one has taken seriously before. So she, I believe, so she's carved out a space, whether that is authority, you know, it's not really authority over anyone kind of but herself in a way. That's important. That's interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the relationship I'm seeing. She mentions there's her... no communal element to this? There, there are some communal elements to this. So there are some things like going to um, going to visit um, going to visit cemeteries as families. So families will do that. Um, and then there are some um, then there are some aspects of uh, uh, funerals that embody this. So as I described, funeral hymns. So funeral hymns are, are written by ministers for the most part. And in the 19th century many of them include these kinds of representations of the dead speaking or being spoken to. So, so, so some of the things, some things like that are communal, community oriented. Um, so there's, so there's a mix. Yeah, I'm sorry. Karina. No, that's okay. <laughs> Last question. I'm just like it's gonna be like it's over. And no, 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 no. You're <laughs> and I'm sorry because I was late, and so um, probably maybe you've already answered the question. Um, and I'll start with an anecdote because I'll get into my point. But there's a member of my family who lost, who became a widow after. And her kid found her diary, which I mean, it could have been what you showed mm -hmm. us. It was really moving to him, but also perplexing because his mother is a staunch Marxist atheist. Oh. And he couldn't, and he actually confronted her at one point mm -hmm. and said, did you, do you believe in God now? And she's like, not at all. <laughs> not knowing that he had read her diary. Uh, so, so, and continues to, you know, be a smart Marxist mm -hmm. and an atheist. So mm -hmm. then that makes me think of, and also when you go to hospice, they have a whole movement for women who, um, who communicate with their unborn children who died, right? Mm -hmm. Or shortly after mm -hmm. death. Yes. And, um, and then I'm wondering how much of the cult of the dead then is not about the, is not a cult of the self, mm. right? Because one of the things that people grieve more than maybe I mean I'm venturing here, but um, more than maybe the other, the loss of the other is the loss of the self, mm -hmm. right? Is the loss of the caretaking and the, the identity building, yeah. relationality. Right, which is why it makes so much sense that it's women, yeah, because yeah. women's identities are about the other, right, and their relation to others. So I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's really interesting. The let me think about it in 18th century terms, right? Because the the key, the one of the key um, category, analytical category of the 18th century is sympathy, and so. And sympathy is seen, and so and this is not something that, that women invent, that male, male philosopher, if Graham were here, he could tell us a lot about this. Um, but Adam Smith was a theorist of sympathy, right? And, uh, and he and other philosophers in the 18th century saw sympathy as kind of the defining feature of humanity uh, and, and of Christianity in particular, because it, it, because it gets us outside of ourself and gets a, it, it's, it's about expressing feelings about the other, okay? Um, but when, when Adam Smith, in, um, uh, in his uh, theory of, of moral sentiments, uh, 1753, um, talks about um, sympathy, the illustration he, he reaches for, almost without thinking, is a mother and her child. And 
So when, 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 when a mother hears her child screaming in pain, a dying child, a really sick child screaming in pain, the mother feels this incredible pain, you know, and it's, 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 it's bound up in all these emotions, that, the connections that she has, the sympathy that she has with this child, even though the child isn't aware of it, you know, it might just be a three-day-old infant crying, it's, it's not really aware of its surroundings or anything like that. It's crying out in pain, but not an existential angst, but she's feeling that. And so, so in 18th century terms, the, the, the experience of the pain of the other was really valued and valuable. So someone like Adam Smith or some of these people would disagree with what you just said about the self. But I think, I think your interpretation makes perfect sense that a lot of what these people are grieving is the loss of their particular role, their connection, their own, you know, and, and that's why Ann Douglas calls it therapeutic self-indulgence because you read enough of this stuff and it starts to feel self-indulgent. It's they're they're spending you know hours and hours cultivating their own bereavement. Um, I tend to be much more kind, uh, much more gentle on these people. Than she is. <laughs> the question was a little bit about the theological, you know, because um, well, like this book I just finished was precisely about end of life experiences that had always been discussed in relation to, to theology and the afterlife, etc. And and kind of the, the research that the doctor I wrote with um, shows is that actually not at all. Like even extremely religious people um, who are dying are gonna dream about family and not have end of life experiences and visions of family and not very few religious ethnography. Mm -hmm. In their end of life, very little, mm -hmm. and that's across the world, mm -hmm. right? So, so that completely recast dying, which was mm -hmm. such a moment of theology, as mm -hmm. something that was much more human. And yeah, I guess I would differ with that by saying that um, that you don't need to think of religious iconography and think of you know a church or a cross or something like that. That if you're if one is imagining a relationship with the dead, with a suprahuman being, that is my religion, my definition of religion. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so well, because it's going back in time, right? So it would be about thinking back on memories from childhood. I see what you're saying. Right, not yeah. about the future needing. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And it's about seeing oneself as a five-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. And reliving true question. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and there's editing going on. So it's, people don't dream about um, a parent who who was responsible for trauma. They dream about the loving father. You mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. it's it's usually yeah mm -hmm. yeah. I would I would disagree with with some of those points, but um, yeah, I'd love to love to discuss this. Yeah, and you can listen to our podcast oh, featuring yeah. Kareen because that is live today. So oh, you can oh, live today. today. Oh, good. yes. So well, if you want to well, learn more right. about. Uh, contemporary analysis of death and dying, then oh, can do that nice. on our yeah. website. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.